kaldırıyor. And to the 50 uh, participants in uh, this auditorium. My name is Erik Berg. Uh, I'm the chairman of uh, Habitat Norway and will moderate uh, today's uh, session. I should make you aware that there are some minor amendments, changes, uh, particularly in the opening session uh, of this uh, event. So, it is a great honor and a pleasure on behalf of uh, Habitat Norway, the Norwegian University of Science and uh, Technology, and the United Nations Human Settlements Program to welcome speakers, more than, as I said, 350 registered participants from all corners of the world, as well uh, as uh, the 50 participants here in the Polytechnical Association of Norway, here in Oslo. We are going to discuss past, present and future uh, relationships between cities, rivers and uh, people within local, national and global uh, context. Rivers connect. This webinar is much more than a discrete single uh, event. It is in fact part of uh, a process to establish a new community of knowledge and uh, practice on people-centered and resilient spaces related to urban rivers. Linking research, um, practice and learning. A new network called PEARLS is underway thanks to the pioneering efforts of uh, Professor Peter Gotch, who is with us digitally from uh, Berlin. He couldn't make it to Oslo today and who soon will uh, address us. The confluence of natural drainage ways and low income neighborhoods makes the river a critical and political battleground for rights to the city and a crucial interface for social, economic and ecological resilience, which increasingly is compounded by current and projected impacts of uh, climate change. Many top-down efforts to remediate riverfront areas have been met by uh, protests and pushbacks. Residents living close to rivers have critical knowledge of local risk of mitigation and adaptation measures. At the same time, localized river remediation projects at a small scale are often not carried out with a holistic understanding of watershed dynamics, infrastructure and housing needs, land policy or flood risks. So navigating these challenges is a key challenge for cities. And the, voice, the voices of residents and civil society need to be very much at the forefront of this conversation. We will hear today about new initiatives that offer opportunities to bridge these divides and bring culture, art and storytelling alongside participatory planning to cre create life and momentum to new plans for green and blue infrastructure. So this webinar brings together Cases from four continents, reflecting the challenges of five important uh, uh, cities. Oslo, Norway, Sulu and Banyar Masin, uh, Indonesia, Nairobi, Kenya, Kathmandu, Nepal and Belo Horizonte, uh, Brazil. Although having very different geographies, histories, demogra demographics and religions, these cities all have intriguing similarities and needs 
and reflect important lessons for equitable, climate responsive and inclusive urban uh, development. Finally, I would like to thank those who have made uh, this event possible. The Ministry of Districts and Local Government has provided uh, the funding. Polytechnical Association has, is technically uh, responsible and will be uh, producing. UN Habitat have effectively uh, disseminated and distributed invitation and uh, invitations to all UN member countries. And not to forget the practical assistance of uh, the Habitat Norway uh, board. We might be the smallest organization of all, but we certainly have uh, the biggest board. So without these efforts, Habitat Day would not have become a uh, reality. Also, a word of thanks to uh, Nico, uh, who has coordinated uh, from Trondheim on the part of uh, NTNU. Well, that was the opening part. Now, the opening speech, I mean. I'm now pleased to give the floor to Marianne Boygen, mayor of uh, Oslo, elected to the city council already in 1979, and has been a permanent member since 1995. And she has in her work demonstrated a strong concern that Oslo should be an inclusive and good children, good city, particularly for children to grow up in. And she has also promoted on a global level this uh, perspective through her engagement in Save the Children. You are very welcome to address us, Marianne. <laughs> Thank you so much. I haven't been in the city council since 1979. I have worked for more than 30 years with children's rights and trying to make the society more livable also for children. So, But thank you so much, dear everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to inaugurate uh, this International Habitat Day event. I am honored to be joining you for the fourth, fourth time on the first Monday of October. It has almost been a tradition. In these troubled times, it is good to come together. I think we need it. Even if it's for some of you, or a lot of you, are a digital event, I think that we need to come together to discuss how we can form a society to be more human-friendly and also to be more climate-friendly. Societies that build trust and safety. And for me, that is what Habitat is all about. I would like to congratulate the organizers, Habitat Norway, the United Nations Human Settlements Program, and the Norwegian University uh, of Science and Technology for having initiated this webinar, which is not only a single event, but, is, but, but as I understand it, a part of a long-term process of building global urban river networks, or networks of networks, of which the city of Oslo would like to be a part. It was along Oslo's major rivers that the Industrial Revolution in Norway started. In the, in the 1840s, a number of waterfalls were har harnessed to drive Oslo's explosive growth economically and population-wise. The contrast between relaxation today along the idyllic riverside and the hard labor of the mills, neighboring a highly polluted river, could not be greater. It took 150 years to change the development perspectives from the industrialization, brown agenda, to the post-modernization, green-blue one. The perspective urban rivers connecting people, cities and rivers might be new to many, but the city of Oslo has for more than 30 years focused on the modernizing, modernizing its waterways. Altogether, there are 10 rivers and streams 
and the Nature Reserve Östensjøvannet nearby where I live. Along Arkuselva and Alnarva, we have worked in cooperation with NGOs, and I know that some of them are here present today, and also the civic society in general, to create new recreational and ecologically sustainable riverbanks and waterfalls for the better of both human beings and flora and fauna. And I would use this opportunity to thank the representatives of the NGOs for pressuring us politically, for using their creativity, and also for their political support to change this in our city. They have been or oh, had, had a huge impact on the political priorities that we have. Today, our open or closed rivers, for that matter, are among the more structuring elements in Oslo's urban development. In particular, our use of nature-based systems to solve climate challenges stands out as an achievement to be learned from. Urban river development is not only about ecology and economy. There are also a social sustainability perspective to handle. The equity or a red, to use colors again, distributive dimension is decisive. We shouldn't forget that lives also are lived under the bridges and in the shadows of badly lighted river banks. These are unsafe areas for many groups, especially the vulnerable groups, where crime, drug sale, and violence prevail. But instead of promoting a policy where such groups are prevented access, my party, the Socialist Left Party, advocates the opening of, up of such environments, making the conditions visible and assisting vulnerable groups to become part and parcel of social life and behavior. I think the green, blue, red experiences of Oslo are relevant for most cities in the world. And as you know, more and more people are living in cities in the world. In some years, it will be like 75% of all people living in the world will live in cities. So we have to share ideas and experiences. And this will also be relevant for what we call the mushrooming new world-class cities that are emerging on all continents. However, our expertise cannot be transferred in wholesale package forms. It needs to be transformed to fit new, challenging socioeconomic and cultural context, of course. We need to learn from each other. We need to have a dialogue and we need to share experiences and our creativity and now I really appreciate the initiative by today's three organizer, organizers to bring university, is, un, universities, research, research and knowledge organizations together into global urban rivers networks. Local authorities, cities and regional governments also need to be part of this alliance, particularly to promote the tra translation of theoretical sustainability concepts into applied practical policies and implementation in our urban environments. So I wish you any time, heartily welcome to Oslo, also those of you who are only looking at this digitally, because we have a lot to offer for you and a lot to, to experience. We have these 10 rivers and streams and the nature reserve Östensjövande. In Oslo, you will today find pressure natural areas along our waterways, rich in bird, fish, animal and plant life, with good walking traits, places to bath, even take saunas, and parklands all surrounded by the capital city's urban bustle. We are also very fortunate to have forests all around the city. So in Oslo, we are very, very uh, fortunate to have this unique location with uh, the fjord, the riverbanks, and also the, uh, the forests that are embracing the city. So very often when we are going to describe Oslo, we say that uh, Oslo is a city where, you, where we call it the blue, the fjord, the green, the forest, and the city in between. So thank you for letting me opening this important seminar. And I wish you all a nice day here in Oslo. And those of you who are digitally, please come whenever you have time. Thank you so much.
Björn Borgen. It's a privilege for me to thank you. Um, we know that you're not continuing as a mayor after this uh, next coming year. Um, uh, one more year, and, and, and that's that's important. Um, I would like, perhaps on behalf of myself, since we met, uh, I think 40 years ago, uh, making guidelines, national guidelines for uh, children and young people, through your important role in, politically speaking, in getting the Fjord City established as a political uh, policy strategy, and through your uh, everlasting engagement in the more vulnerable people in the city, uh, related to the improvement programs that we've had for different parts of the less affluent areas. And finally, the fact that you actually uh, take the energy, have the energy to come and join these habitat uh, um, events is very important. I think it sort of underlines the importance of what many different NGOs are doing. So thank you very much. Uh, you are going to work hard another year, but we still like to give you a bunch of flowers. Thank you. <laughs> The last speaker of our opening sequence is Peter Gotch. He is professor at the Department of Architecture and Design, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. This department, this university, has, I think, for three and a half decades been an important partner and supporter of Habitat Norway's work. And Peter has, in particular, been working on questions of sustainable urbanization in an international uh, context for more than 25 years. And he is currently, with other good partners, developing the network of uh, pearls. Peter, the floor is yours from Berlin. First, we take Berlin. I wish I could uh, and so I prefer to uh, be safe and not traveling at the moment. Uh, I'm joining you from the city of Kassel in Germany, uh, but uh, that is uh, not a big issue. Uh, I, I have been part of the program called Urban Ecological Planning at NTNU, and you will meet the Franz Bjornes emeritus professor who will give you a proper lecture. So um, I'm really happy to, to join all of you, to meet all of you, that we can make this possible uh, to the participants and to the presenters who join from far away, from Indonesia, from Nairobi, from Brazil. Uh, um, that is uh, very exciting for me that this can ha happen. Um, I want to extend to all the attendants, the host and the partners without uh, having the time now to name all of them in the detail. But it's, uh, it's particularly Habitat Norway as a partner who can uh, host this event with us and promote this uh, emerging network on urban rivers. So I have two small questions left for introduction. And uh, you have uh, you have already uh, recognized uh, this uh, this term. So Pearls is uh, wants to be a new network of knowledge and practice, a community of knowledge and practice, as we like to say, that is centered on river spaces uh, uh, that we are building up. We had we we did have an event in the world. Of Forum in Katowice in July, and we also develop a website and develop this network as an open source platform for international organization NGOs. And what, what you will see today is a very particular example of a part, a potential part of this network where we don't see research papers presented, 
but we see reports uh, from the ground, from the practice. We see about we we will learn about our experiences. Uh, uh, the the last uh, question or issue I want to raise is um, that this network, how we see it, it has a focus on public spaces and commons. Uh, this has been the case also with other initiatives uh, and networks for sure. But uh, due to our own personal history and due to our own uh, interest and also what we find relevant and the, and the specific partners, uh, the, the other colleague that joined in person today is Jose Chong. Hi, Jose. He is the, the leader, current leader of the Global Public Space Program. And um, I, I, I think it's really important to promote reverse commons in many places around the world to, to promote the, both the environment and the social and the economic development. Um, I think everybody of us can remember and can think about experiences with rivers. I just name one experience from my personal life. In the city of Kassel, where I grew up, they have a river called Fulda, and attached to that is a big park since several hundred years. And I suburb to the inner city to take the bike along the river, even if it is a longer distance. No, this is some experience also researchers has affirmed that if we have a pleasant and beautiful journey, we will uh, don't mind spending five or more, uh, five or 10 more minutes that's point also to the emotional attractiveness of rivers. I think uh, that all of us could experience, and may, we could we could we could bring up examples from many many cities, particularly also very beautiful where the, the this river Isa really manages to bring the nature in the city, and from you hold 10, uh, 10 minutes or, or by bicycle, and then you feel like uh, you, you already left the city, you are part of nature. So, of course, this uh, look very closely about not to exclude the vulnerable and to be inclusive. Uh, we need especially also uh, a focus of this Pearls Network is to balance social and environmental needs and goals and to um, to to uh, identify joint opportunities when we when we do environmental development, how can we also promote social development? Many times these two ends clash with each other and create conflict. But how can we turn it around and, may, and turn them into opportunities? Um, uh, with some presentation, we will learn that we need time to develop rivers, but it is. It's worthwhile to start small and to continue and have a long vision. And we will see uh, by the example from Oslo, uh, from Ellen, that uh, time is needed and it's really important to, to have this vision and to take uh, small steps. And I will close with also pointing to this attractiveness of rivers something that can integrate no it, it integ we already have integrates different people it integrates different academic disciplines it integrates different professionals when we work about plans and project and developing rivers so so it is really the rivers we can see it as a metaphor of a table where we can sit around and try to solve our problems of today which are very much related to climate change of problems is also there. So, so uh, thanks again, and uh, I will uh, uh, I look forward to listen to the presentation and the join uh, to the rest of the workshop. And I send you many greetings. Thank you.
We will now hear uh, the keynote speech of uh, today. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Professor uh, Tari Twett, presently at the Geography Department, University of uh, Bergen, a prolific academic author and documentary filmmaker on water and uh, the right to water. And I think, also being a historian myself, uh, Tarja has more than any other present Norwegian historian questioned the dominant worldviews and ideas of Norwegian development history and also foreign policy. For instance, the role of Norway as a humanitarian uh, superpower. Professor Tret will speak on the topic of urban development and water society systems and analytical approach. The floor is yours, Tarja. Thank you. Uh, I just discovered that I have misunderstood everything. Uh, I, I didn't know that it was about rivers. I mean, I've been traveling down rivers. I've been researching on rivers for 40 years now. I've been down all the major rivers in the world. And I really love them. I can talk about the Nile. I can talk about the Yangtze, the Yellow River, the Amazon, everything. And I didn't talk about it. I didn't prepare to talk about it. So it was my mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, so what I will instead try to do, I will try to do what uh, I've said that I'm going to do. I will talk about water society systems and an analytical approach. I mean, not on the rivers, but water society systems, which is something different. It is, of course, relevant to the topic of today, uh, I hope. <coughs> but when I prepared this speech, I read again this um, new urban agenda from 2016, made by um, Habitat UN. And uh, you know, at the moment I'm trying to finish a study that I've been doing for 35 years about the water and the industrial revolution, comparing 11 countries or empires and their main cities from the period of 1500 to 1820. And what surprised me then when I started to read this document again was it is astonishing in the way it is certain about its own conceptions and descriptions of reality. Absolutely astonishing. Because what does it say? In its own words, I mean, the agenda says they represent a paradigm shift, which is very, very radical. Represents a paradigm shift. They say it is based on the science of cities. Very strong uh, expression again. I mean, the science of cities. And they say that they describe what is universal standards and principles for city planning. Universal standards of city planning. I mean, this is interesting. Uh, <clears throat> and its authority and position is, you know, laid out in a very specific way. I'm now quoting. Member states, intergovernmental organizations, the United Nations Human Settlement Program, plus more than 40 United Nations agencies, funds and programs, 200 policy unit experts with 20 co-leading organizations, 16 partner constitu constituent groups of the General Assembly of Partners, thousands of subnational and local governments, and all major networks of local and regional governments coordinated by the Global Task Force, Task Force of Local and Regional Government. 197 participating states, over 1,100 organizations, and more than 58,000 networks were involved in the preparations of the document. And finally, the new urban agenda was adopted without reservations. So, we can just go home. What is it more to say?
that it's a logical question, isn't it? Uh, but I think that when it comes to the water urban nexus, it is definitely something to say because if you read that agenda again, you will see that when it comes to the urban water question, it is not very central to the way the 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 the, the plan is is uh, the, in the way the plan is is formulated, and that is not that is not strange because you know for a very very long time. Research on cities were very dry science. I mean, the water question was not relevant at all. I mean, it was a paradox. On the one hand, everybody understands that all cities, at all times, everywhere in the world, all the, the city's history are written in water, you might say. But at the same time, the research on these cities' history uh, had left the water question out side the analytical frame. I mean, the, the first guy who talked about the urban revolution was an, archeolo was an archeologist called uh, Gordon Child. In the 1930s, he, turned, he came up with the term urban revolution. He said it was very, very difficult to define, but he said that it is possible to list 10 things that characterizes a city. And that 10 things was a kind of a list that all people for a long period, used in order to understand what was going on in cities. The point with all these temp uh, issues was that none of them dealt with water. Water was left out. Why? I mean, today that is a national qu natural question to ask. Since we are all here, everybody agrees that water is a fundamental issue to the water development. So why did not this happen. And I've done, I've gone through recent literature on urban studies and water in this book, and I have a chapter on it, and a, quite a critical assessment of the historiogra historiography of water and urban studies. And I went through, for example, all the 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 the, the, the all the um, volumes of the Journal of Urban Studies between 2006 and 2012, six years. There were 14,000 pages about, and only 86 dealt with water. Nothing. And in the 1990s, the European Association of Urban Historians established the Historical Urban Series. All 35 volumes, not one dealt with water. So. What's happening? I mean, you can understand the, the, the inhabitant. I mean, they were talking about cities more or less as water blind as the historical research tradition has been. And of course, this was not because people were stupid. I mean, the researchers were just as blind <laughs> or just as stupid as we are. I mean, I it has nothing to do with that. It was not intentional, of course. But what it tells, it tells us something about the power of perspective perspectives and the power of how you conceptualize the world. Because as the way I read this is that, you know, the whole social science tradition with starting with uh, Emil Durkheim in the late 1800s through Marx Weber, Karl Marx, whatever, they all considered or they all said that what social science should do is to be concerned with social facts, and only facts that can be explained by other social facts. I mean, they defined the boundaries of their research field as a field that should only be concerned with social facts. And therefore, natural geographical facts as rivers, as waters, were just left out of the picture. The way you started to bring water into the picture, you were criticized for be being determinist or whatever, nature determinist. That was the worst thing you could be for many, many decades within the social science tradition. So, <clears throat> and then you have develop the, the, the idea of de developmentalism, of course. I mean, the whole idea that urban development was a proce process whereby humankind left nature behind. There were not every they were not ever more, you know, uh, uh, 
under the tyranny of the, nat of, of the forces of nature. No, they were liberated from the forces of nature. That's the point with the city. That was the point with the modern times. So, and then, of course, you got the social, the, 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 the postmodernism of the 1990s, who said that, you know, nature didn't exist except as a social construct. So they could talk about the river, but the river was only just a social construct. I mean, it didn't exist as physical geography. So there was a long, long, broad history behind this dry science about urban history. So that is one of those paradoxes, I would say, that people who are dealing with urban development and urban planning today have to relate to, because although people within this room have another opinion, people outside this room will still be very much influenced by this tradition. That's at least my experience. So that is one, <coughs> um, what I would call paradox of water. I mean, as I said, all cities, the history of all cities can be written in water, but the histories that have been written about cit cities are almost, in many cases, without water. Without water. It's a paradox. Anybody who writes the history of Oslo today, or the history of London, of course, or the history of Cairo, or the history of whatever, will bring the water into the picture. But traditionally, that has not been the case. Another, <coughs> so I think that there, we have a problem with how cities have been understood as a social phenomenon related to physical and geographical um, uh, factors as water. But in addition to that, water is in itself, according to my opinion, is not properly understood either, because what is water? If you go to textbooks, you will always see that water is described as a natural phenomenon only. But is it really? Is water only natural? Will you understand how you relate to water in the urban uh, context if you regard water all, only as a natural phenomenon? I don't think so, because water is unique in the sense that it is the same in nature as it is in society. You can not find any other natural resource that operates in the same way. Take the example of, that, of an apple. If you eat an apple, at some stage, the apple will cease to be nature. It becomes social or socialized. Then you eat it, right? If it's, half, if, if it's after you've eaten the half of it or whatever, at some stage, point in time, it ceases to be, to be nature and becomes something else. But water is the same in nature as in the toilet, within you as in the waterfall. So how can water then only be seen as natural, since it's the most social thing of all social things? It's with, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. And it's the same. So if I'm right, that will have something to say, will it not? About how you conceive, how you think, not only about the world, but also of how you plan cities' future development. The same, of course, the apple, you can compare with the tree. The tree ceased to be nature after it's become a nylon stocking or a newspaper. It's not a tree anymore. But as I said, the water is the same whatever you do with it. Because at the end of the day, it re-emerges as itself, as H2O. Uh, <coughs> so, as I said, it's, it's, nat it's nature and social at the same time. In addition, I think that it's also fruitful to think about not only the hydrological cycle, which of course has to be understood, 
I mean, whether it's possible to export the experience of Oslo to other places is not only a question about whether they have, whether it's not only a question about the social economic context of other places, but it is also a question of how is the local hydrological cycle in that area. I mean, the Arkish Elba in Oslo is very, very special. There are 24 waterfalls within the border of the city. There is no other capital in the world that can be compared to Arkish Elba when it comes to its potential for industrial development within the, main, within the capital. So you cannot compare <laughs> Oslo with, with Amsterdam or Oslo with Cairo. There is no place in Cairo where you can put, uh, <laughs> where you can develop electrical energy from the river. So it cannot be compared. There is no place in Amsterdam even where you can produce electricity from the river, and so on and so forth. So my point is that in addition to the hydrological cycle, you have to also understand the hydrosocial cycle. We should talk about both. Because water is moving, of course, in the atmosphere, these big physical processes, but water is also moving through societies. And when water is moving through societies, water will be influenced by societies in different ways according to what kind of society the rivers are floating through. So if you think about water and water systems, not only as something that has to do with hydrological cycles, but with the interconnections, the confluences between the hydrological cycle and the hydrosocial cycle, I think that you will understand it better, and I think that you will possess possibilities of future water planning and urban de developments in different ways than if you do not understand this question, this issue, in this more broad, perhaps more complicated way. I don't know. So, <clears throat> the same holds for rivers. I mean, rivers are, of course, not only natural things. There are almost no natural river anymore running through cities. They're all a result of a hydrosocial cycle as well. I mean, they're all engineered to one, ext I mean, in one way or another. So, the idea, to re the idea about restoring nature is perhaps a little bit utopian, or is an illusion, isn't it? It's more about restoring rivers and engineer the rivers in more, in, in, in more modern ways, you might say, than what the rivers traditionally were. And I think that this is a very optimistic view because it gives you a lot of opportunities that you do not have if you think you have to restore the rivers as nature because that kind of nature has ceased to exist. It was long, 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 long time ago. So then the whole question becomes a different question in a way if you think about um, also the rivers as products, not only of the hydrological cycle, but also of the hydrosocial cycle and the confluences and connections between them. And again, another paradox <laughs> with water, if you, if you like, is that of course it's possible to destroy a river, it's possible to deplete a groundwater reservoir. But you cannot destroy water. Water is, per definition, sustainable. Because it, whatever happens in... I mean, go to London, for example. I mean, the River Thames. In the 19th century, all over London, there were signs. If you take a cup of water from the Thames, Thames that would be a cup of death. That was the sign. So don't drink it. Now, 150 years afterwards, people are fishing on this Mr. Bridge. Right? 
They destroyed the river, but because water in itself is sustainable, it was possible to restore the river after 150 years. So it's, again, a very optimistic <laughs> view. I mean, water gives you another chance every year, again and again and again and again, because water in itself is sustainable, while rivers are not, while groundwater reservoirs are not. So uh, <coughs> by, thinking of, uh, by thinking about water in this way, I think that uh, the whole discussion about water and society will not, of course, be entirely different, but it will be a little bit different, and it might, again, create more both optimism and more realism in urban city planning in the long term. Uh, <coughs> And so, and in this way I can go on. I mean, there are more other pa paradoxes as well, of course. I mean, the, the whole question about power and water, the flows of water is, of course, also the flows of power, and it's flows of powerlessness. It's obvious. I mean, those people who control water in the urban context in the future, I mean, when millions upon millions of people will be living in very, very small areas, will, of course, have a tremendous power is a bit the population, compared to all other rulers in the past. Because you cannot control the country or the, 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 the people in the countryside in the same way, because they could always find some other source, you know, find some other way out. But in these mega cities, those people, whether it's a state or private companies, who own their water will have a potential tyrannical form of power vis-a-vis -vis the people. As we know from history, I mean, everybody here might have heard about Leonardo da Vinci who tried to uh, wipe out um, Pisa in the war between the Italian city-states in the early 15th, 16th century, or about the aquatic warfare in China and so on and so forth. So to control water is, of course, to control life. So if you manage to control water in these mega cities, you will also have a potential power that few other rulers in the past will have. But on the other hand, the rulers will also be very weak because everybody can point to the rulers if the water system is collapsing. They cannot, they cannot escape the responsibility. They cannot blame God. They cannot blame uh, anything else than their ability to give sufficient water to the people. So, <clears throat> but the point, I mean, this is, um, uh, there are so many, I would say, um, aspects of water society relations that have not been really addressed within the humanities or the social science tradition because the whole issue for so long has been outside. Uh, the research interest. So I think there is a lot of really great potential see, for, for improving knowledge and for um, enlightening uh, the discussion about water control now and in the future. And what I've done then, I've tried to come up with this very, very simple, the point is, the simpler, the better, that is my opinion. <laughs> and a very straightforward, in a way, approach to how this can be done. I call it the water society system approach. I mean, there might be also other approaches here, but that might be just as fruitful as this one. I don't know. But the point is that it must be important to try to develop research strategies that are less reductionist than what was the case in the past. I mean, when you had the whole social science tradition that just defined the water issue outside what research should be do researchers should be doing. Uh, so we need a kind of a, an approach that both focuses on the physical aspects, 
the engineered aspects, I mean human tampering with nature, human adaptation to both systems, and of course you need also a kind of an approach that makes it possible to integrate fully ideas about water and how they have changed over time or how they are different from societies to societies. Because it's obvious, the more you understand the history of urban cities in, and their relation to water, the, idea, the, 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 the role of ideas about water, I mean, is so important. And the reason why we are here today is, of course, an, exp an illustration of that fact. I mean, that people now are talking about green cities, bringing the river back, bringing the streams back. Bring, I mean, it's all new ideas. Nobody was talking about it 20, 40, or 50 years ago. I mean, demolishing dams in the United States, as they're doing and also in other countries, it's new. And everything has to do with new ideas about water. So in order to understand everything <laughs> and the interconnections between everything, I think you need an, an analytical approach that focuses on these three layers that I've been talking about, both the physical, the, the human and engineered landscape, and how people are thinking about it, either religiously, secularly, or whatever. So, I will conclude by saying that the whole, I mean, the issue of urban planning, the planning of mega cities, will force people to quite another extent than until today to address all these questions about water because it's obvious. I mean, the gap between supply and demand for water will increase. If you get a city of 20 million, 30 million people, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket science to understand that. And you need a very, very complicated system for sewage. <laughs> so, so it goes without saying. But that means that these kind of conceptual discussions, I think, will be helpful and that people do not rush to solutions thinking that they are acting on what is already scientifically proven, proven or when that has not been achieved yet. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tarje, for sharing your knowledge, your ideas and your uh, analysis with us. I must say that your misunderstanding uh, has been quite uh, creative and uh, inspiring and uh, we would certainly like to pursue the issues you have raised today within uh, the context of uh, the Pearls uh, network. So we certainly look forward to uh, future cooperation uh, with you. From one inspiration to another, we will now turn to six practices. One from the north and five from the global south. First out is Ellen de Wiebe on how Oslo is doing it. A global model, uh, uh, question mark. She is a qualified architect and urban planner and has worked for 20 years until 2020 as director of the planning and building agency in Oslo. She has, among others, directed the strategic planning work for vast parts and neighborhood of Oslo that give the city uh, its modern character and uh, uniqueness. Ellen is a pro prolific publicist, speaker, lecturer, and activist, and of course, a member of the executive board of Habitat Norway. Welcome, Ellen. Um, thank you, Eric, for the possibility of talking about Oslo. I always love talking about Oslo. I will, can I see the slides on 
the PC? No, okay. Um, I will talk about nature, human beings, and methods. And um, let me first of all, let's see, is it this one? Let me first of all remind us that river management uh, has to be part of a holistic climate management. Um, Oslo has for six years had uh, climate budgeting as part of the ordinary fiscal budgeting processes and heads at the moment a C40 climate budgeting network. And I added also the front page of Mumbai um, climate action plan, which also emphasizes that uh, it's not only a matter of urban rivers, the rural rivers are as important and have to be considered holistically um, if we are to succeed. No, not that one. First, nature. Rivers are basis for our flora and fauna, we know that. And rivers structure the urban landscape. The Oslo Park strategy from 70 years back um, has been the basis for today's management. And Oslo has for about 30 years um, been working with reopening the rivers. Many waterways um, have been everywhere in the world, I think, the backyard of the cities and giving us ample of risks. Um, but it has all, they have also been the basis, especially today, for green added values. Um, the use, you to the right, you see some of the um, brooks and um, nature-based systems that have been used in urban development in Oslo. And the use of nature-based systems, um, I think we started applying properly, properly um, about 10, 15 years ago, um, using phytoremediation, i.e. using nature to purify polluted grounds. Um, uh, this is at uh, Grudedal River Park. And the interesting thing is that instead of using big lorries to transport a lot of polluted ground to other uh, deposits, we used um, plants to purify the polluted grounds. And within two to three years, you had to replant, but then you had solved uh, or saved all that transport um, unwanted masses. Some years ago, we made a What is happening? There we are. Uh, some years ago, we made a lighting plan for the CBD of Oslo. Um, and we were very concerned about how human beings should be safe when moving along the rivers. Uh, and you can see in the middle the undulating uh, turquoise line of the river of Akselva. Um, and what we did realize as we went along was that we couldn't only cater for human beings because the fish also had to be shielded. If we didn't uh, have dark nights, uh, the sex life of the fish would not be good. Perhaps it's the same with human beings, I don't know. That was what I was going to say about nature. Then, <laughs> then the human beings. Um, of course, they are Im I immensely important to us as a race. Um, and reopening the rivers um, uh, has been important for us for two or three decades, as I said. And also digging up land and recreating the water um, spaces um, uh, into the city has been important. And to the left, or to, on both of these, you see the Arkish Elva uh, as it reaches the fjord uh, together with the new Monk Museum. And these riverbanks have become very popular recreational areas for most people, both inhabitants and visitors. Let us look a bit more of, 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 at this. We think, I think, as a planner, I think most planners think, that reopening the riverbanks has been a method of appropriation, a method of 
making uh, the local spaces become more uh, full of identity and giving people belong or feel a feeling of belonging to these areas. Uh, for instance, about 15 years ago, we had an exhibition at the Grudy Park that I showed you earlier to the left with um, materials and objects from immigrant women uh, making an, uh, using a big tree as an exhibition. And of course, we had the um, autumn, I don't know what you would call it, torch uh, hike up along the rivers. We have that each year for some of the biggest uh, rivers. And to the right, uh, anti-bullying concert. Um, and in my mind, this increases livability and equity. Uh, also, uh, recreational and um, social equitable areas uh, should be for everybody. And um, the access, whether it is permanently high quality areas or temporary areas, uh, are important because they are always used by people. They are always. Um, uh, occupied. I remember last autumn when I talked to this Tamil lady, she'd caught 10 mackerels that day and was very happy for her dinner. Um, I thought that was great. Also, gender and uh, the question of safe public spaces is important. And Anna Falu says that safe cities for women are safe cities for everybody. But riverbanks are not always safe. They may be quite dark, they may be quite um, vulnerable to drug dealings and different types of uh, problems. Um, sometimes we use temporary pocket parks to sort of try and handle or improve the livability of public spaces, like the one to the left, which is not by a river. And to the right, you see Eva Sturdusen's master uh, project for at the School of Architecture in Oslo for the old stone town in Zanzibar, where one saw that a lot of the public space it had become less accessible to women because they had either become tourist places or they had become um, occupied by other groups. And what she found was that uh, women needed differ differentiated and shielded spaces. And in this pavilion, you can see that the lower level is more accessible than the level further up. And do we then think along those terms when we consider the river? Quite recently, we have um, had this big project, which is a very popular project, um, approved and built, Bjerkedal, multifunctional. I guess some of uh, uh, people that will talk later may talk about this. Um, um, it is uh, uh, given different types of prices. It was based on participation and mobilization, for instance, with uh, immigrant women, because they didn't want to hike in the forested green belt. They wanted to walk in open landscape, so to speak, in open, safe um, footpaths, which is what one has done here. And one has sort of combined nature and local ac activities in a good manner. Still, I would like to sort of put a question to you. A couple of weeks ago, Angela Ruth Kivle, a PhD um, student at the School of Architecture, quoted the American Geographer Association. Um, you can go and look at this yourself. It's quite a long and heavy um, article. It says, Urban greening is a deeply political project grounded in technocratic principles and a naive, apolitical assumption that greening will, unassisted, result in both more just and prosperous cities. When I heard this read, I was a bit taken aback, because greenery is always good. We know from Alexander Stoller, the Swedish architect, who's done surveys, that when you have more greenery uh, uh, close to dwellings, the property uh, values increase. And what these uh, researchers say is that uh, by uh, sort of enthusiastically just pouring a lot of greenery into the urban space, what you do is you increase the property values and thereby increase gentrification and thereby forces people who actually need these green spaces to move out. So the que is que uh, key question then is, is our focus on uh, rewilding the 
uh, cities and especially the rivers decreasing social equity or increasing? I think it's quite an interesting uh, uh, question. And of course I don't mean that we are not going to rewild the rivers and the cities, but do we have the good uh, and adequate strategic approach for counterbalancing these type of gentrification? Then I'll move on to the methods. Um, and I'm jumping a bit to and fro, geographically speaking now. Um, Re, um, restructuring, refurbishing rivers takes a lot of time. I would say nothing less than 10 years, perhaps 20 or 30 years. So you need to be patient and focused. Um, and uh, the Alna Elwe, we made a structure plan for some years ago. The middle part in the middle map is the part where the national government owns the land and w they wouldn't agree to opening up the river through this industrial part. Quite thought provoking. Um, but uh, through a lot of local support, also from the NGOs and from the city, I would say, several uh, waterfalls and different types of constructions have been um, constructed so that now this river is very popular as a recreational uh, space for everybody. If we also look at another tool we have is a planning brief that we first time used uh, at the beginning of the 21st century um, where uh, this is quite a big uh, urban redevelopment area at Ensha. Um, and also here we needed to have focused attention. Um, the Hovenbruck uh, has been restructured and reopened and sort of creates a new urban morpho morphology. You, I think you understand the um, drawings and you can see the result now that has been built. Another uh, tool we have is what we call a framework plan for public space structures, Veiledende plan for offentlig rumvepoid. Um, and this is not a legally binding tool, but it shows the sort of long-term vision we have from for the different spaces. Um, and I would like to uh, point out the two, two grey columns you see in the middle here, because that those two columns, one has a sort of high uh, quality standard and one has a normal quality standard. And then it's uh, described for each, uh, for different types of, uh, of areas, streets, parks, and so on. And then the property agency of Oslo can start calculating what it costs to get all these um, areas adjacent to the Alna River running through this, uh, this uh, map. Um, and then we can negotiate planning obligations, urban contracts with the developers. So in addition to sort of um, water taxes, we also managed to uh, fund some of these um, uh, river projects or at least adjacent spaces through the uh, uh, planning obligations. The last example I would like to show you is of, of a tool is something that was presented only a week ago at Oslo Urban uh, uh, Week. Um, and it is about, uh, you see the old 1950s plan for the green structure, and then to the right you see a proposal for superblocks, the uh, Barcelonian concept of traffic calming projects. You, some of you probably know those, uh, that concept. But instead of using only the blocks, the sort of quartal uh, for each area. One lets the rivers be the borders of these superblock areas. Um, and I think then we have really turned the next level of refining and developing our planning tools when we let these um, structuring, strongly structuring uh, structures also uh, handle how we uh, uh, cater for the traffic management. Um, I must mention before I finish off the norm for the blue-green factor because you can't handle the rivers without also handling water on land. And 
Um, this is about um, the city prescribing a differentiated coefficient for different uh, areas of the city for how much greenery you should have. And the developers then being able themselves to design on whether they should provide it through a lot of trees or other types of greenery. So they decide how. But uh, these type of uh, quality guidelines, I think, are quite important uh, in order to, to handle both uh, land and rivers for uh, handling the water. And the conclusions may be as for other uh, planning topics or, or, or tasks, but I would like to um, emphasize the need for long-term persistence, the co-creation, especially with vulnerable groups that is easy to forget. Do the children of uh, us, the white middle class, um, need a skating ring, or do the immigrant women need a place to sell their goods? And of course, the last one is to combine temporary and permanent solution to get to where you want to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen, for your uh, informative and uh, eloquent uh, presentation. I particularly like uh, the way you uh, emphasize the three dimensions of sustainable uh, development. It's not only about economic sustainability, it's not only about uh, ecological uh, sustainability, but there is a very, very important equity function here, which we have to, uh, to, 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 to face and to, to, to handle. And particularly, I think the gender issues need to be brought much more into the public debate. So, now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. So we will take a leap across the globe in southeasterly direction. I would very much like to uh, welcome Risa Hidayani, program manager of Kota Kita Foundation, Indonesia. Risa has been engaged in urban participatory planning activities for more than 10 years and trying to involve and uh, benefit the most vulnerable group. Her topic for today's event is co-design and placemaking approach in the informal riverbank settlements of Sulu and Pan Karmasin, uh, Indonesia. I would like also to take this um, opportunity to express uh, our sincere uh, condolences to the people of Indonesia in connection with the stadium uh, disaster that uh, very recently took, part, took place in, in Jakarta. Please, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Rizka Hidayani, and I'm a program manager for uh, Urban Resilience at And today I would like to share our experience and peace making experience in Solo and Banjarmas in Indonesia. Maybe a little bit about Kota Kita. We are a non profit of Solo with expertise in urban planning and citizen participation. and the, uh, in the design and development of these making place and then maybe uh, before I uh, cases on the public space in Indonesia in Panjatmasin and in so the context about public space refers and in Indonesia um, as in many other places in the world actually uh, historically refers are the main connection and transportation channels in many Indonesian cities, including in Solo and Banjarmasin, which attract settlers, workers, and social economic activities. So river in Indonesia are dense but settlement areas. So uh, these river bank areas in Indonesia usually faces many challenges. It is often surrounded by a dense urban settlement with lack of access to basic services, for example, 
water sanitation, uh, waste management, a space for social interaction, and often it faces a lot, a lot of environmental challenges, for example, prone to flooding and other natural hazard. And, and actually, many uh, government programs right now have targeted the improvement of basic services in the riverbank areas, but uh, opportunity to further cultivate a thriving public space in this area are often overlooked. And but we believe um, riverbank areas have the potential to become an active public space that improve the quality of uh, life of local residents and accessible to the local communities. And, and most of the, the time, women and uh, there's actually a lot, a lot of opportunity where many riverbank development program. Uh, there are many uh, riverbank development program uh, as an opportunity for entry points. And there is also opportunity to uh, integrate environmental and social core benefits uh, in the development of riverbank, particularly for the low income communities uh, that typically live in the area. Share our experience in two places here, one in Banjarmasin. But I would uh, share the case in Banjarmasin first because this is the, uh, our very first uh, co design process in the riverbank area in Indonesia and uh, the city is actually called a city of thousand river because uh, the city have a lot of uh, big uh, rivers and the activity of the community there is actually centered around the river and the economic activities are actually growing alongside the river and 2011, 2013 where we work with group of residents in uh, a neighborhood called Sungai Jinga which is a densely populated neighborhood and uh, uh, which uh, has low income uh, communities and uh, this is the situation in the neighborhood where uh, there's a lot of uh, garbage in the river and in the roadside the space uh, to be used by the community and then water pollution is the main problem there. And we do the co-design process with the community there quite in intensively to identify the challenges and design the new public space uh, with the residents there. Uh, as you can see there, uh, the residents is actually uh, involved in the uh, designing the development of the space. And uh, this was actually the uh, design, the final design that was agreed by the community. And this this is how it was uh, after the implementation. And uh, after almost 10 years uh, later, the space is still used by the residents today. And um, the key to success to the uh, uh, this small scale public space in the uh, river bank, Banjar, uh, one is the, uh, the meaningful participation of the citizen in the development of the public space in the their involvement in the co-design process is actually strengthened the sense of ownership to the space where uh, the community is actually the one who's doing the maintenance of the spaces and keep the spaces alive and uh, second is the, the uh, we use the local materials in banjar machine which actually uh, stronger and it contributes to the sustainability and durability of the space after uh, being implemented for more than 10 years. And then third is um, because uh, River has a central part, uh, this space is actually uh, uh, maintaining the connection uh, of the community to the river. So so it's uh, because of the activity of the community is actually centered in the river area. So this space is actually uh, bridging the activities uh, of the community and the activities in the river. Um, and the second case that I would like to share is uh, the case in Solo, which is actually uh, an ongoing process that we're still uh, undertaking right now as we speak. And uh, in Solo, we took the case of Kali Pepe, one of the river uh, in the city, one of the main river in the city. And um, compared to Banjarmasin, the, uh, the, the condition of the river is quite different because Solo is quite, quite, quite smaller. The population is more dense. And um, what I, I would like to highlight here is the uh, the Pepe River is actually have a historical importance to the solo urban development, where uh, it was the center of the first the 
refer. Kali prepare refer. So, so as you can see, uh, the condition of the refer is quite different with the one in Banjarmasin where this this one is uh, smaller and it's really surrounded by a dense settlement area. And uh, as you can see in the picture, the quality of the one on the left, up left, um, it's quite dense. So it's lack of spacious spaces for social interaction. Uh, that is inclusive for all of the residents and uh, there's no space for kids to play they often need to go far to play uh, which often expose them to danger and then um, generally in the development of public space uh, in the city of Solo there's a lack of inclusive infrastructure which makes the public space are not accessible for the vulnerable groups so and and if we're talking about uh, the development of public space, the predominant paradigm is still the development of formal public space, which is the big scale public space, big space, big scale parks, uh, things like that. But we actually see the opportunities of this small scale common space in the neighborhood. They often um, offer a little, but they actually present an opportunities for green open space because they are actually needed and they are uh, accessible by the local communities. So we did a survey there in the uh, Kali Pepe River Bank. Uh, in the short span of the uh, small river, there's actually more than 29 location of informal power and actually uh, being used and actively being used by the local communities. And um, the social aspect of the uh, Small scale river is actually uh, intrigued us to promote the transformation of the riverbank areas as an inclusive and resilient public space that can be used and accessed by uh, all residents, regardless age, gender, and ability. And how do we do that? Um, we actually conducted a series of co design sessions and these five uh, discussions that we have this far. Uh, different community members, including uh, children, uh, elderly women, persons with disabilities, to be in the situations here. And um, we aim to create a space where everyone, including the groups, feel free to share their aspirations. So we use um, engaging tools to facilitate the aspiration of vulnerable groups here. For example, uh, with kids, we use swapped uh, image, for example. This is for children and imagination of the public space, for example. And for um, elderly and adult participants, use aspiration uh, card to break the ice with them because this is um, we entering a new community. We need to uh, to create activities that can uh, involve everyone, and everyone feel free to share their aspiration and we use this to break the ice with them and communicate their aspiration for example uh, one of these participants are identifying fire as a danger when they are using public space for example um, um, in the in Kali Pepe area we also social inclusion issues and for this we use tools called persona which actually represent uh, characters of uh, people with specific vulnerability that might exist in their community, for example, elderly person, uh, hearing impairment, and et cetera, and many more. And uh, we actually illustrate their struggle based on actual cases, uh, be more aware with the actual struggle, struggle of the groups. Uh, we hope that, that these tools can, can improve the uh, can solve an issue on the public space. And um, the, the result of the discussion is the needs of vulnerable groups are identified by the, by the community, which was not they, uh, the conversation about ensuring physical accessibility of the space, by, by including RAM guiding block was uh, brought up by the community safety and comfortability for the user, for example, uh, uh, especially for the elderly by providing shades, vegetation, and safe materials for children, for example, and promoting inclusive activities for uh, all, all people. And um, we also uh, do the core design. And uh, as you can see in the picture, there's a lot of children really engaging uh, this 
process uh, as uh, fair, uh, this process was uh, really providing children a participation in the design of the public space because they can actually express their, their idea and their need in the actual forum uh, involving adults as well. Um, this was the presentation uh, of the result of the public space that um, we did. And as you can see in the picture, there are some children who's actually uh, representing, representing the group to share their ideas as well. So this was really uh, providing the space for for them to women and other vulnerable groups. And this is just an illustration of the uh, process uh, and the, re uh, the result of the uh, design process with the communities. And uh, actually, the process is still ongoing up until now where we create the schematic design. And, and the next step will be the implementation. But uh, so far, our reflection is we try to be as uh, inclusive as we can inclusion issues to the uh, community so the the uh, public space can be more inclusive in the sense and he, this is some reflection we have right now versus um understanding local context is really dynamics for example in the banjarmasin area and in this area where the people are uh, living in a social of the involvement might be different to ensure the sustainability of this uh, space and uh, second in the co-design process such as Minecraft and other tools uh, can really put the children and uh, other vulnerable groups as the center of the cushion uh, principle and guideline and uh, lastly the co-design process uh, for us is key to build the sense of ownership to the public space and to connect with the river as the common within the community and as this process is still ongoing, uh, we hope that the inclusive process can contribute in the development of accessible and functional small-scale riverbank public space for the local communities. Uh, I guess that's all for now. Uh, happy to discuss further. And thank you very much for the opportunity. We move on to Nairobi, the capital of uh, Kenya. We move to the office of uh, the Conque uh, Design Initiative, where we find Pascal Mukanga, Planning Associate. So Pascal, he coordinates participation and development strategies for urban resilience related to public spaces. He will address us on the topic of Nairobi River of Life project, peace, rights and environmental justice. The floor is yours, Pascal. Uh, I'm an urban planner and I currently work with, with uh, um, uh, KDI or uh, Conquit Design Initiative as a planning associate. And I am very excited to be here, although I'm joining virtually, but uh, from Nairobi, but I'm very excited to be here and share some of the work that, that myself is doing um, uh, in Nairobi and also in other places. The introduction of KDA is that we are a nonprofit design and community development organization, and we work. Uh, in urban areas um, uh, to advance equity in, in, in these neighborhoods and address various um, social uh, special issues. KDI uh, also has offices in the Coachella Valley in the United States, and we disciplinary team uh, who come together and bring their shared experiences or different experiences uh, and partner with the community to be able to um, uh, improve the, the quality of life. So I will jump uh, right in to my presentation today and uh, um, just a little reflection on 
rivers and people is that um, we do, uh, or as many of us have been mentioning even in, in this uh, seminar, is that uh, many uh, informal settlements uh, or low-income neighborhoods in urban areas, are, and this is just among many uh, marginal areas where such informal settlements exist, uh, where uh, apart from the Thrace rivers, these areas also normally lack incidental infrastructure. All the major slums forming um, rivers. So, for example, if we talk about the Kibera informal settlements, which I think is informal settlements in, in Kenya and, and in Africa, uh, and maybe talk, all of these have formed along uh, a major river within the city, uh, which is the Ngong River. And uh, because of that, then issues of flooding and, uh, and, and other related um, uh, challenges. And so we see that indeed, um, because of this inherent um, uh, locational aspect um, of informal settlements, then there is this complex of social, spatial, uh, and environmental justice issues that, uh, that, that are present or are faced by residents that are living in, in such neighborhoods. And I think um, as we try to unravel some of these issues, uh, some critical questions that we, I, that we think should be asked are how do we go about these uh, processes and how do we ensure that in these processes then we are still able to safeguard uh, the rights of the residents that actually live in these informal settlements and also how do we uh, ensure that there are meaningful uh, opportunities for residents to actually also participate in these processes and, and contribute. And Helen was also uh, presenting on the example of Oslo. She mentioned that there's the issue of time, that refurbishing rivers actually uh, um, is something that takes time in a week or one month or maybe even one year. It, 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 uh, it's something that takes time. And so then the question is, where do you start? and uh, KDI, uh, we have been able to um, develop an approach or a process that gives us really uh, a good example of where you could start, where you first look at an alternative process to river rehabilitation, uh, as, opposed for, uh, as opposed to moving or removing people from the river so that you are able to rehabilitate it, you, you are still able to uh, create um, various river infrastructure, which will address uh, various social needs uh, and economic needs of the community, as well as recreational, but at the same time, uh, still protect this, this, this river. And through this approach, uh, starting from six. Uh, KDA has been uh, together with the community public spaces along the rivers uh, with a focus on one particular informal settlement um, uh, called Kibera, uh, which, which is in Nairobi. Uh, from 2019, uh, KDA together with other partners uh, embarked on a program uh, uh, called Realizing Urban Nature Based. And this program has various components, uh, and one component 
is what we call the rivers and people plan. So people plan it's uh, mainly uh, building up on the work that together with communities working along uh, the river banks to build a network of river infrastructure uh, that enable river remediation or rehabilitation, but at the same time address various needs of the of the community. And the aim as a people plan is to is together with the community to co-develop a sort of uh, blue green river infrastructure master plan uh, from which uh, uh, some public space interventions or some river infrastructure interventions may be uh, identified for piloting and, and this just goes back to a principle that um, it's it's starting small while building up towards a bigger and larger scale uh, at the same progress. For the Rivers and People Plan, uh, KDA is implementing this in uh, in, in in the city of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, but it's also implementing this in, in the city of Nairobi and specifically in the Mukuru informal settlements. So the experience that we are sharing is uh, mainly focused on what the work that we've been doing so far in the Mukuru informal settlement. So just looking at uh, the process that we've been undergoing, we've been trying to, uh, as I mentioned, to take or undertake a holistic approach. And I think uh, that is the approach that KDI uh, and other organizations uh, have been and should continue taking when it comes to um, working with communities living in low-income uh, uh, areas to actually be able to remedi remediate their rivers. So from the uh, social, environmental, and economic dimension, uh, our process has first included conducting uh, through desk research and uh, uh, thematic data collection, uh, conducting a, a thorough uh, multi-scale analysis of the river watershed and the case in point here being the Ngong River, which is where we are focusing on. So being able to look at this river um, from multiple scales and also uh, trying to understand uh, aspects of social, environmental, uh, and how they intersect uh, and impact on the relationship that people uh, eventually have with the river. Um, and and, and I, I think uh, even to go further is that uh, in the process that once the rivers and people um, some physical interventions uh, are identified, another place where we feel there are opportunities to uh, also address other needs, including economic needs, is in the construction process because uh, KDA's approach has always been to undertake a participatory construction process where it is the residents who will end up building that public space or building that particular uh, river infrastructure. Um, in, in not uh, leaving anyone behind and also safeguarding the rights and ensuring inclusion, it goes back to the rivers and people plan that first of all, uh, we know that the nature of our informal settlements, and I'm speaking here specifically in Nairobi, is that uh, the densities are very high and we have uh, housing structures even being constructed right at the edge of the river channel itself. Um, and if you will say you are removing these people, sometimes it's it's a complex uh, situation and a complex process and, and, and how that process is actually going to be addressed. Um, but under the Rivers and People Plan, we propose this alternative a uh, or, or, or we are telling the government that they need to move these people from or remove them from the river, but uh, how do we 
uh, create or develop uh, river infrastructure, ensure they still retain their right uh, to housing, but at the same time, add the possible uh, economical impacts of uh, flooding and, 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 and related hazards. And then there's the issue of participation collaboration that is between the residents of the informal stand with KDI and other partners, including academic partners. And of course, uh, the process is evidence-based, uh, as I mentioned earlier, based on that at uh, multiple scales, just to understand the relationships that people actually have uh, with the river. And then there's the aspect of integration, linking these small scale interventions uh, with other uh, natural and physical systems, but also uh, being able to address uh, various needs, including environmental, social, and economic needs within the process. So, in in uh, in further highlighting uh, this bit on rights is in our process in Mukuru, in which uh, we are now calling it. The rivers and people plan area. So this is the area that we will uh, be working with the community of the Mukuru informal settlement, uh, a section of that settlement, uh, to develop the rivers and people uh, plan with them. And uh, one of the things that we did is, uh, as we were identifying and mapping this area, we also did a walkabout with the uh, community leaders as part of the process, just to be able to, to get a good idea. Uh, and, uh, also understanding that there is always more knowledge within the community about their area and about their issues and about the potential challenges that may be experienced within that process. So far, I've been, been able to conduct a number of engagements uh, with the residents. Um, so we started with a visioning workshop, and this uh, we engaged the community uh, and different groups with the community, including persons with disabilities, uh, men, women, uh, and youth, um, uh, to be able to, first of all, uh, develop a, a better understanding of the project and what the Rivers and People Plan is, but also to uh, understand the issues that they face as it relates to the river which is flowing through the informal settlement, which is the Ngong River. Uh, but then after that, the de developing a vision for the, their neighborhood. What kind of neighborhood will they, or do they want to see, or do they want to have? Uh, and of course, we, we, we develop this in terms of short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, visions with, with the community. As part of still our data collection, we undertook uh, uh, some focus group discussion uh, with, the, with the community as well, where we got to talk about the river and relations to various other dimensions, including looking at some of the anthropogenic factors that may impact uh, how the river functions or flows through the informal settlement or even the health of the river in terms of its quality, um, among other, uh, other, other aspects. Um, then uh, one other thing we did is we really wanted the community to uh, uh, also uh, be part of the process of developing the outputs in this process, including being part of uh, collecting the data, but also developing that data. And so one of the things we, we did is we, we undertook a participatory community mapping training with the community where we were able to uh, uh, train on. And it was very interesting to see how actually in the community there were already people who are very well able to read maps and they also had a very good understanding of their area and so they were able to actually contribute uh, a lot in the process. 
Um, and then after the training, we, uh, we, we, we did the mapping of various river and environmental issues within, within the defined rivers and people plan area. And this was done in groups. And each group, of course, had a community leader. Each group had somebody who was un uh, undertaking a short survey. And then we had two people from the community who were actually the ones sketching on the physical map the different issues that were being noted across the different themes that we had developed with them. So we did that. And from here, uh, this process is still ongoing. So the next stage is actually supposed to be that KDI will go back to the community in a validation workshop to be able to present back the data that we collected, of course, in a little bit of a more processed way uh, to highlight uh, that highlights the key finding, but also give opportunity to uh, for the community to decide whether we uh, need to go uh, a little deeper in our data collection or sustainability. In terms of how we see going and uh, even being sustainable, is uh, it links back to the work that KDA has been doing over the years, but we are also looking at how then this work joins uh, with the uh, with the long-term uh, initiatives at citywide level, and uh, uh, that includes uh, the linkage that we have with the Nairobi River Life Project, which is part of the Nairobi River Regeneration Initiative, which is a bigger uh, and the Kenyan government, and it covers the, uh, the two main river basins in the city of Nairobi. And uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, KDI or, or, or will be soon initiating a sub-component of this, known as emphasizing ecosystems and elevating people, which is just a continuation of the work under the Rivers and People Plan. Uh, uh, throughout the, the maybe the coming one or two years, and this is actually supposed to feed into the Nairobi uh, River Life Project. The idea also of developing the community is that the community, at some point, we can be able to uh, take this output, which is the Rivers and People Plan, and go and advocate uh, to the government to be able to channel some investment. I we need to move on. I would like to introduce you to a living legend with a unique career as a researcher, a teacher, and an institution builder. Having, for instance, initiated uh, graduate and PhD programs in urban ecological planning at NTNU, uh, and UNESCO has assigned him for uh, three periods to Nepal to work with educational facilities, building conservation and training, and in world heritage discourses. His latest research involvements are with rights, development and conservation issues in post-disaster contexts in Bhopal, India, and Kathmandu, Nepal. I would like to welcome to the floor Professor Emeritus Hans Bjarnes, who also was one of the founding fathers of Habitat Norway back in 1988. The floor is yours, Hans. Yes, thank you. Tariet uh, Twet, he told us that water is the most social of all social things. I can tell you that housing by the urban poor is the most social of all social things. And this is what we are dealing with here. It is a situation where I got this, this title, but it was said population. The riverine population of Kathmandu, present, past, and future. This, this is a title for a week seminar. And, and of course, it was a, an 
it, it's actually my life which is in the title. So how to tell about this in, in 10 minutes? So I, I decided actually to, to write to my best colleagues in, in, in Nepal because of the legitimacy of going to Nepal with our students and dealing with these issues with the marginal citizens of Kathmandu was to learn, but it was also to create positive change. How can we actually work with the local people, the local committed people, in creating a kind of commitment to do something with the situation? And I must say, when I look back on this now, this was in the mid-80s, we were extremely, extremely fortunate to be linked to people who were committed and have done this to their lifetime, you can say, mission to deal with, with the people of the, of the slums. I call them citizens because that is the first point. They must be regarded as citizens if you don't respect the homeless in the slum settlements as citizens, then we are on the wrong course. Today, they are talked about only as squatters. And squatters, by definition, are mainly there to secure land rights and access to land. That is one way of, designing, of, of, of defi defining them. The other way of defining them is that they are slum dwellers. Then, at least, we highlight the need for housing, for safe housing, a secure housing. But they are actually the poor citizens, they are homeless and they are landless. And this is extremely important to state because of a learning dealing with this in the, in the early, early 1990s, we had a chance for three years to work with a program which was, was called TASK, Training in Slum Upgrading and, and uh, rehabilitation in, uh, in Kathmandu, task, an area upgrading as slum rehabilitation. And we had a chance to go to India with all of our trainees. And we met the, uh, the slum wing of Delhi Development Authority. And we were acquainted with how they deal with this issue. They actually scanned the settlements and in that way, they find out if they have land elsewhere and they see if they are legitimate. But the main strategy is to link the settlements to NGOs. So one thing is that you, you create a situation where you bring partners of development into the situation. And Manjit Singh, who is the, what is, what, what the mathematician who was the head of the slum wing of Delhi, Delhi Development Authority at that time, they, did, they created a positive change. And that is all, all the time what is our chance is to create positive change. Well, this, was, this introduction was too long. Rivers in Nepal are rivers of life. They are all of the Ganga Delta in this part of Himalaya. And this is Shivaratri. This is the night of Lord Shiva, where women through the night celebrate Lord Shiva, and they pray to Lord Shiva. The background picture here is on the bridge over to, to the part where we were working on first. And you see the, it's down to, this is a 1400 meter above sea level. And you see the winter fog and, and the living conditions in the winter are extremely hard, but there's never snow in the Kathmandu Valley. So I will, try to be brief and go through four main questions. It's the question of who, it's the question of what is the context, it's the question of why can we make a change, and it's the question of how. So these are the three main questions, but the who question is actually the main question, and it should be the only question we ask first. We really have to see, we have to know, like Manjit Singh did in the Delhi, who are we working for and how, how can we address the people who are most in need? So our situation working with, with, with the Vishnumati River settlement, 
I will come back to this now. The second thing is female-headed households. I will also come back to that, and also what is the present situation. When we came to Kathmandu, we were told they were all from Bihar, from the poorest state in India, and they were seasonal people coming in the hot se summer season. And possibly they were here. But the people we identified in the Vishnumati River, which is one, the main tributary river to Bagmati River in Kathmandu Valley, they turned out to be low caste Navars or the butcher or sweeper caste. They were marginalized from the main settlements of the, of the big. And they had terrible stories. And Anna Margrethe Lunde, who is sitting here today, she did with Savitri Shesta, another sociologist, a Nepali sociologist, very important studies on going into the life situation of female-headed households. Most of the people living in Indrayani settlement at that time were female-headed households. They were households who were divorced or they had been kicked out because the men had married again or the men had died, like Maya's man, he, husband here, he had died of alcoholism. And she tried to, to survive on re repairing umbrellas. She had three children, but they didn't came to come to see her. So she was one of the founder members of the local committee we managed to make. More on that also. The situation was like this. Here you also see, feel the winter situation. See the small child there. We managed to document that the child mortality was much, much higher than in the main, main settlements in the, and in the permanent settlements. And this became very important for our colleagues in the, in the department. And it made the point that we have to do something about it. And of course, there are our own people also. So these studies in that way, to, through the people we worked with, like Savitri Shesta, like Vibga Joshi, who became the director of, of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and later became state secretary for the environment. And over, over Mahindra Suba, who, who was a PhD student in Norway, who worked on, on urban boundaries, trying to contain urban growth. And we had Pranita Shesta, who worked specifically on the new settlement at Bagmati Rivers. All these people have contributed to what I'm saying now because I wanted to be updated. And I really want to honor them. And they have all engaged through their lives with this. The situation looks, looks pretty nice here. But the situation is, this is not at the height of monsoon, where the river is coming far higher than the walls you see here. So the situation of the river settlements are really exposed, and it is not an easy question. Actually, our main strategy has been all the time to say that we have to work with the settlers here in the way, the, the, the dwellers in the way where they can continue to live where they are, because they are so locally dependent on, on in terms of their income opportunities. But resettlement in some cases is necessary but very difficult, and that this is why I come to the context, because there is a context here. Traditionally, you had a settlement of, of the, the historical settlement of Kathmandu, it's on what they call tar land or high land, and you had the floodplains around. So this was a part of the floodplain, and on the floodplain you had the Kacha settlements, the impermanent settlements, in not burned bricks like this, where the low caste people lived outside the city boundaries. And this was where we started to work. So you see, it was extremely exposed to, 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 to flooding. But what is also very important to understand is that it is all a question of land. And this is from a Landsat picture that time, from a satellite picture which tells that all this area of Kathmandu Valley, Kathmandu Valley is approximately this large here on this picture, but all this part 
They have a dual crop system in, in the, every season. There, there is, there is uh, rice in the, in the monsoon season. There is wheat in the winter season. And this is in the winter season. And it was fallow. It was not cultivated. And that was because they had tenant farmers to work on the land. And if they gave the tenant farmers the right to work, continue to work on the land after the, after the, 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 the rules and regulations uh, introduced by the government, then they had to give the land, they have to give a certain portion of the land to the tenant farmers. So then the land owners rather stopped helping the tenant farmers. So land at the basis in a society like Nepal is very culturally determined and very socially determined in the favor of those who are landowners. We managed to make a neighborhood committee. We hired also the, uh, at that time it was forbidden to make, uh, make uh, interest organizations in Nepal by the government at that time under the kingdom. And, uh, but we managed to register it and we managed to get them to understand that you need women in your committee because most of you are women. So half of the representatives here are women, you see. But they are not sitting in front. Here you see again the issue of land. You see, by inheritance, it's a question of the parental properties. And they are not after the building, but they're after a piece of the land. And then you get this kind of histograms like you see here, which is extremely dangerous in a, one of the highest earthquake zones in the world, which we felt in 2015. So where are the settlements now? Actually, this is not totally new. This is from 2015. I've got it from our PhD student, uh, Planita Shrestha. And you see all the, the, the bears here. They are by the rivers. This is the, this is the main Bagmati River, and these are the tribunal rivers you see here. Here, where you're working first time up here. And the others are more and more have come up in the areas where there are slopes, so, and the river settlements have been, been mostly demolished now. So what the why question, it is very nice to announce that the government of Nepal has got a new constitution in favor of housing. Housing rights has become a part of human rights in the context of Nepal. And this was further uh, declared in 2018 when they made the special rules and regulations for the housing of the government at different levels. At the ward level, at the municipal level, at uh, the district level, and also at the, the, uh, the new province level, and also at the federal level. So this has been taken seriously, but of course to give housing to the people is a, a huge affair in every country. As here you see the situation how it was. This here was, I was there in August, the same place you saw in the picture here. Now it is a development area. There are no really effort to do it in a way which can contribute neither the, the people who used to live there nor a better environment. But in some places, it became an opportunity for making road access and to also to do environmental measures. This is a kind of new urban landscape you see in Kathmandu now. And very recently, the mayor, the new mayor of, of, of uh, Kathmandu, Mahanagarpalika, of the, of the main municipality, has declared that there shall be setback for the small rivers coming down to the main river. But of course, it is too late. You see already most of the buildings are within a four meter setback. I told you about going to India and learning in India. And what was so important with this opportunity we got that time was that they came back. And then we were actually, because they had just got a multi-party system in Nepal, and they understood that, that now we have the opportunity to do something locally. And seeing the situation in India, like you see there and you see here, it is Coming back to Nepal was like coming back to, oh, this is easy. We can easily create a positive change for our citizens. 
Of course, it is very easy, but still, the scale is so different, and the complexity is so different, and the, po po the, the, the misuse of political power is also so different in Nepal. It's a more transparent society, a more open society. So the last question, or the last issue, it has to be a people-based entrance. You cannot do this as an overall planning exercise. It has to start with who are the residents. The situation is like this. You see, you can see the wastewater goes out like this. It is a, a situation of poverty. In some areas, of course, there's a, a situation where people are really after the land rights of the place. But in most cases, it is like this. It is a challenge of sanitary infrastructure to improve the health situation. And actually, what we did, we did not many development works because our situation was there to learn. But we managed once in, in Rayani to collect 80,000 rupees, which was around $3,000 that time. It was a big sewer line coming down in the middle of the settlement before the river, financed by the World Bank for many years ago. And we managed to use this money to prolong the sewer line out in the river. So they didn't get the sewer up in this <laughs> the living environment in the middle of the monsoon. I mean, there are simple measures like this which are, has to be identified locally. It has to be the situation, the context has to be understood. It is a complex situation, and the premise makers for what we do are very much local in this situation. But in terms of the environment, compost making in the rivers is a tradition in Nepal. And this picture is, is from the, one of the small towns in townships in, Kathma, in the Kathmandu Valley called Bhaktapur, where still in the, in the late 80s, they were making compost of all agriculture waste. Now, waste is a huge problem in the context of Nepal, because it took up on the valley. But the main challenge remains is education. And I must say that <laughs> over, over, over main, main uh, finding is that the poor also in the squatter settlements prioritize their children to get better education than what they could do. And these two girls, this is in Saval Bahal, it, it's not in the squatter settlement, in a, but in a, in a sweeper settlement, a permanent sweeper settlement. It is Ramita Shesta, our, one of our UEP students, urban ecological planning students, who interviews them. They live in a, one small hut where the parents are both working in, in, in restaurants. And they use all the money for the education of the girls. They see a future in education. So if we can link our programs with, with training, then we are, actually that is the main strategy. And then we come back to that, that actually the main thing, the main social thing is to, to, to really deal with these settlements in, in the way which is seeing the whole situation, the physical matter is only a part mind apart, but also, of course, in a session apart. That's not me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hans, for uh, educating us. And, uh, for a lifelong service for uh, students, academics, and uh, poor people, poor urban people, all, uh, all uh, over. We now move on to Brazil, and I hope we have with us Carolina Heller, Supervisor of Environmental Management, City of Belo Horizonte. She is a civil engineer by education, a specialist in environmental engineering with focus on water, sanitation, environment, and engineering design. She will talk on the topic of community in the valley, new uses for the Umka Creek banks. I'm looking forward to your message. 
Ролина. Ролина. I work at Urbel, the company of urbanization and housing of Belo Horizonte's municipality in Brazil. I'm really pleased to be here today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll start this presentation telling you a little bit about Belo Horizonte. Then I'll present the Onça River program, the important role of the community, the technical social work done by Urbel, and then the new uses that are being created for the Onça River Bank. Belo Horizonte is the cap in the sixth largest city of Brazil in population, with 5.2 million inhabitants in the metropolitan region. Its territory is practically all urbanized, with an average density of 7.2 inhabitants per square kilometer. The IGDE is 0 0.84, which is considered a high level of development. But this index hides the municipality's annual budget is around $2.6 billion. Belo Horizonte has a territory with a high quantity of water courses. We can see in this map the river's distribution in the city. Those are the four main basins, Oro, Velhas, and Onça. At Onça Basin, the main sub-basin is also named Onça, and it's where our project take, takes place. Our city rivers. Historically, during the urbanization process, many of these streams were rectified and channeled represented today over than 200 kilometers of canalization. On one hand, we know the detrimental consequences of the canalization process for the environment, the water, the population. On the other hand, a non for those who can afford for housing, leaving behind the low-income population who need to resort to unsafe high flood risk. Well, to start, here are some images of how life was by Onsa River before the intervention and how high the flood level could reach. If we look carefully, we see all these poor houses here and the water literally entering the buildings. Or this man here with the water by his knee level. Unfortunately, it's in rainy season. Due to all these misfortunes, the community has gathered together and engaged with Comupra, a community NGO of the river, and demanded public service for fam families' replacements and interventions in the river area and surroundings. Based on the community demand and technical studies carried out by the municipality, by the government, Interventions were implemented, aiming to reduce flood risk, including removal and resettlement of the family. From this process, new public spaces were created where privileges that were hard to give new uses for these new areas. An intense and complex discussion process with the community took place, mediated by Urbel, in which the households decided what and how to do in each area. They had to consider possible uses for flooding areas, possible interventions that they could afford and build, considering that everything is made in self-management. I'd like to highlight that all the interventions were planned by the dwellers and are being implemented and maintained by them. With the municipality, at this point, the project got the cooperation of UN Habitat in the context of the Global Public Space Program. about the population in initiatives. Comupra was created in 2001, and their aim is based on the idea of, of straightening in a project that combines sustainability and the struggle for worthy housing. They promote the transformation in the Onsa region. 
carrying out actions for the benefit of the local population and the, along with Comupa, the region has also the movement Deixem Onça Beber Água Limpa. I will explain. In Portuguese, Onça is the animal jaguar. So the movement is a pun that means let the jaguar drink together. They carry out actions to improve life quality of the community, education, health, work, leisure, income generation, ecology, and citizenship. The movement Let the Jaguar Drink Clean Water often assembles population to collectively decide what is going to take place in the liberate areas of the riverbanks. Considering the house removals, the sanitation system wants the river water and the urbanization of surroundings. In this context, as support, Urbel comes with the technical social work, with the main motto of socioeconomic and environmental sustainability. After all the technical studies taken by the government, almost 16 were identified as live with flood risk and had to be removed and resettled. Today, today 800 got already removed. To carry this work out the most appropriate as possible, along with the dwellers, such as workshops, partnerships with NGOs, community associations, schools, and entrepreneurship associations, came together to do cleaning and cropping in areas recently released by removals. As I said, all the activities are self managed. One very important result of the work that we should highlight is this map that has been produced in many workshops with different groups of Riverside communities. And it serves as a guide. They call it the uh, people folks carefully over the map, thinking about which use would be the most suitable for each area, considering many factors, such as the potential of the place, the possible flood level of that specific area, the ways of building accessible to the population, such as labor, inputs, budget. Here are some of the use that came out. View points, courts, including sand courts, agroforestry, memorial and monument, community gardens, vegetable gardens, playgrounds, living social areas, seedling nursery, amphitheater, built in gardens, etc. Many of them have been already built. For example, the community vegetable gardens are already producing food, providing not just food itself, but also income to the population involved. And Habitat Award in Google Space Program. In Belo Horizonte, the project and the creation of a new public space with, space with new engagement of the community along Onsa through different mechanisms. It provides contribution with the Onsa Riverbanks implementation. The project has also the objective of creating and strengthening innovative, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable public space in two flood-prone areas. And also support fostering collective planning through digital process, Minecraft workshops mostly, and other participatory mechanisms. The interventions will take place in two different neighborhoods along the river. Novo Arão. The areas chosen to receive the intervention through the project are expected to be the pilot for the transformation of other areas. Possibly forming a... The delimitation considers strategic locations because there already exists an engagement of neighboring population with the care of the region. Here, we can localize what has been planned. In letter F, the ecological trail, which has a symbolic nature and will be implemented as an improvement of the sidewalk. Its future extension will form a trail along the river. The track will receive landscaping, urban furniture, and braille signs. That will be an extension of the vegetable garden already in implementation phase by the community. In layer C and layer E, the, the 
the Minecraft workshop. The proposal of the Minecraft workshop is for children and for teenagers to come furniture in the playground area. In letter F, we have the renovation of the soccer field with the new fence installation. And in letter G, urban fortune in the area of the future artistic which will be designed by the community. The Minecraft workshops are going to take place in schools next week. Here we have a current image of the agroforest already implemented, providing food and income. Expansion on this area. And we can also see here a communal sink built by the dwellers, showing us the care and the attention that they have with the area and its needs. And here, what we have with the toys in the agroforest. I'd like to illustrate here with this photo of the waterfall. That's a nowadays photo with the urbanization here and show us the power and the importance of Onsa River. That's in the urban area. And this other photo show us the care in place. The sign that they are making there says, welcome to the Onsa River Park. I help with the, the word improvement. I started with Onsa. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to discuss further. <clears throat> thank you very much, Carolina. I'm getting more and more convinced that the approaches that we used in rural development back in the 1970s and 1980s with multi-sectoral integrated uh, resource development programs also is an approach for the future in, in city urban uh, development. So, now you can unless your uh, seat belts. We are back in uh, Oslo with uh, Cecil Andersen, Deputy Chair, Oslo River uh, Forum. Whilst Ellen spoke on how Oslo is doing it, Cecil will explain how Oslo River Forum do it. Cecil is a planning practitioner who has worked both in private and public sectors. She has vast experience, for instance, with area development, planning and implementation of local meeting places. Now she is retired but active uh, as deputy chair in Oslo Elbe Forum. And then to all of you out there watching us, we are very happy to learn that more than 400 uh, people have uh, watched uh, this production uh, this uh, afternoon. And I still think there are quite a number uh, with us. Cecil, the floor is yours. Shall I use this? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is uh, Cecil Andersen, and uh, as Eric said, I'm an architect as, uh, for profession and urban planner. And uh, I worked in, uh, in both the Ministry of Environment in private practice and in Oslo, city of Oslo. Um, <coughs> so I'll make it quite uh, simple, since it's uh, uh, towards the end. And... Uh, uh, because, uh, um, yes, I'll just uh, make a very brief, uh, 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 to make you understand the situation of Oslo. Oslo is, of course, very fortunate. It has uh, the surrounding and protecting hills and forests to the west, north, and east, and then the hills... Uh, fall gently down to the fjord in the south. So, of course, this is a very fortunate uh, setting for a city. And we are lucky Oslo goes from this 
river. We have 10 rivers, as uh, mentioned. Uh, this is the uh, border, one border river, and this is the other. And then we have the, um, the uh, reserve water reserve area of the Lake Östensjö. So uh, all the rivers fall down to the fjord, but we also have one uh, river, the Ellingsru River. It's uh, going eastwards, northeastwards, and down to the Öjern and Glomma, which is the biggest uh, river in Norway. So that's uh, the setting. I will not uh, uh, read this. You can read it later. But uh, these uh, 10 uh, pictures, now these 10 rivers gives us 10 long parks. Uh, we call them long parks. And uh, uh, that connects the, the forest and the fjord. And you have, it's like um, a finger <laughs> structure of rivers going down to the fjord. And because you have these long uh, parks uh, with not a l far distance in between, that means that uh, very many people in Oslo, most uh, people in Oslo has access to, to these uh, rivers. But uh, still, uh, the, still uh, one quarter of the rivers are on the ground in, uh, in, um, in uh, culverts and uh, uh, because in the last uh, century, starting in the late uh, 1800s, uh, they want to get rid of the streams and put them underground to hide, the, to hide it uh, because they were ill ill uh, smelling, it was dirty, it was a problem. And then, um, but then uh, in the 70s, uh, a lot of the environment awakening in Norway and all over the world, I think, uh, there were some politicians and some enthusiasts that wanted uh, to, re to uh, not to lock any more rivers underground, but to reopen them. And it was a very soft beginning because it was not very uh, accepted at the time. They still wanted to keep it under, uh, underground. But then, uh, uh, so Oslo River Forum was uh, established in one in uh, year 2000. Then it was, uh, uh, they worked for 30 years and then uh, they established this uh, uh, Oslo River Forum uh, to, pro uh, to promote reopening and to promote just general taking care of those rivers already open. And uh, now, so we have turned around the politics of closing everything underground to reopening the rivers. And <laughs> There are three main reasons for this. It's adapting to climate changes, it's improving water quality, and exp expanding the recurrent uh, areas and space for recreation, and uh, not least, improving the public health. As we saw in, uh, in uh, the two years of the pandemic, people got uh, out and went up and down the rivers. And it was a very awakening time for many people to discover the rivers. Um, <clears throat> and here you see one very popular uh, place that was made some years ago in uh, Akersjelva. And uh, talking about uh, safety and so on, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a quite a rough uh, place for small kids, but they are everywhere, as you can see. But I think the social control is very, it's, it's uh, a lot of social control. So uh, uh, this is very popular. But of course, the same river can get really very rough in, 
in uh, stormy times. So you have to have to think for the rough times and for the sunny times. And uh, these 10 uh, river catchments, they are very different. Some are very natural. This is a natural uh, place, not very much uh, uh, made uh, up by uh, humans. But uh, also here you see early summer, a dry summer, and the same place, rough, rougher in the autumn. So it's, uh, you're getting, you get uh, an awareness of the weather by, by uh, using these uh, rivers. And uh, 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 we also have, um, in uh, the last 10 years, I live in this place myself. It's uh, a transforming former industrial areas into neighborhoods and introducing solutions to climate change. For instance, the, the water coming from the roofs are delayed on the roofs and then it goes down to the front gardens of, of the flats and then it's delayed there before it goes into the river. Um, so this is a way of handling and delaying water when it's too much of it. And here is, uh, yes, in 2018, uh, no, it's, I, I, it, this is wrong. It's, <laughs> In 2019, Oslo was chosen as a green capital of, of Europe. And one of the reasons for this was our reopening and taking back the rivers, introducing water into the green spaces. Uh, so here is uh, uh, the photo is from 2018. It was a very dry summer, but uh, even then, the water was still running and keeping the sides green. And here you can see uh, this is maybe one of the first street rivers. You have, the, you have the pedestrian, you have the buildings, pedestrians, the, with a lot of sitting, sitting uh, groups. And then you have the river, then you have some protective uh, uh, vegetation, and then you have the traffic zone. So this is, and I think uh, talking about the, the riverbanks and, and safety, I think when you make the rivers so attractive, it's, it, you also, with the attraction and the use, you get the social control. So in, uh, you were talking about the park, <laughs> Bjerkedalen Park, and I think uh, I, I was in that uh, project and we had a lot of participation. Uh, but I think uh, the introduction of the river <coughs> did not make the place more unsafe because you had all the flats on all, this, all uh, both sides. It was an integration of the uh, living area space and the park. So you get the social control. Uh, but of course, some riverbanks are uh, more, more um, dangerous. But I think here you have the water and the river so close to where people live that they all overlook the river. And uh, also, this follows uh, social control. Yes, so we have these 10 river catchments, and then uh, we have 10 river groups. And I think why people are in these groups, they are small groups and very big groups, and uh, this uh, Östensjö Lake has 250,000 users <laughs> every year, and 8,000 schools coming there. So it's very different, uh, some are very, very small. But uh, we have these people on, and they start maybe not thinking, oh, I have to go into a river group. No, they, I think it might be fishing, bird watching, biology, history, exercise. 
They come into the river environment for different reasons. And then when they uh, are, uh, are uh, using the river a lot, the river will be more important because it, it becomes bigger than the smaller activities. And that's why we have these groups uh, just keep on uh, going back to these groups. So what are they doing? Uh, they are following up uh, planning and zoning cases. They submit com comments and strongly protest when necessary. And they are in media. They are uh, editing home pages, being in contact with local politicians on all levels and arranging river walks and activities for all uh, ages, including schools. And uh, we also have a system of schools can adopt a nearby uh, stretch of the river uh, uh, and uh, the mayor and the school uh, signs a contract and they use this for educational purpose. And they use uh, riverbanks for all kinds of meetings and going up and down. Uh, so the list of interest is long. But for me, I think also uh, when introducing the water into a park landscape, you introduce, you open up for a lot of sense. Uh, all the senses are involved. Uh, it's smell, touch, sight. You can put your feet if it's clean enough and so on. So it's giving a more complex uh, adventure. And because this uh, complexity, you can s escape from everyday duties just by taking a walk or a uh, weekend with the family along, along the, the rivers. So for instance, just showing a few slides here, uh, this is a leader of the Council of Education in Oslo. She uh, just a few, uh, maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, she opened an outdoor classroom on the banks of the river Janselva. And the group of the river Janselva, they have built this themselves and they also managed to find the money for it. So this is a very active group. And then, of course, uh, this is the nature reserve of Östensjö. And uh, in the winter, it all gets frozen. And you have this uh, beautiful activities when it's possible. And also in, in the summer. This is one of the sources for the Hovinbecken stream up in the woods before it starts running down to the fjord. And of course, fishing is very, it's a very, very popular uh, for many. You have groups of fishers and, and they are filming, the, filming it, uh, putting it uh, out to the public on YouTube, look what we got here and so on. And uh, so we try, uh, and this is, uh, the, um, of course, the, um, the the city, uh, city management, they prepare all this. So, so but they prepare for making uh, the, a good living condition for fish. Here's a salmon, uh, salmon ladder just opened one or two years ago. So, uh, but uh, one of the main things I said that uh, these groups are protesting when because the biggest uh, threat to the rivers are uh, politicians. They say, oh, we want to save this, and they are very, very uh, positive to the rivers. But when it comes to the actual uh, planning decisions, they make, they um, transcend the river protection areas of 20 meters and 12 meters very often. And of course, with a very strong uh, uh, development in the last years, uh, they, 
the river, river front to the river has been very popular. So they, it's difficult to keep it, uh, keep it uh, away from the uh, river uh, enough to give space to the water and the green mm -hmm. areas. <coughs> but uh, but uh, so sometimes uh, we just have to really uh, yes. This is we. This is an Akershelva meeting in the fjord, <coughs> meeting in the fjord. And uh, because we open up more and more, you can reintroduce traditional boats and a lot of activities that was not there before. Um, and, uh, but sometimes, because <laughs> uh, the protection of the rivers are not safe, we, we uh, need to protest. And uh, as you see, this is a lot of gray-haired people, all gray-haired and all uh, environmentalists from the 70s, still alive and still strong. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, also what we have to do sometimes. Okay. education of the uh, younger generations. And I think the approaches you use uh, with regard to school pupils adopting streams is a very, very constructive way of doing it. Uh, it, it which, is, which is a model that uh, could be used uh, elsewhere. So, whether you believe it or not, we are now uh, reaching the closing of this uh, webinar. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Jose Chong, head of Global uh, Public Space Program of UN Habitat, to outline where we stand and uh, where uh, we go with regard to putting research and model development uh, into practice. Jose uh, has a long track record from managing global programs for urban planning strategies, urban regeneration, and public space policies in international organizations. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Eric, and thanks, thanks a lot for, for the audience like, to stay with us until so late, so it's like a, it seems like a, you are very passionate about uh, the topic. And uh, for me, um, um, I, I wanted to thank first like, to the organizer, to, to Habitat Norge and the uh, uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology like, to support us, like, to organize this event. Uh, this is an initiative like, uh, that we are uh, strongly uh, supporting as a part of the uh, engagement that we believe like, from the public space program is important like, to focus, particularly after seeing like, these uh, nice examples like, coming up like, from all over the, the world. This is my first time in Oslo, in Norway, but I wanted to, to raise uh, two, two issues that is quite important, that is very close like, to the United Nations in general. Um, we have, the, of course, you know, uh, the. Tigre Lion, uh, that is like a, was the first Secretary General of the uh, United Nations, so it's like a, this is quite important for us. But also it's like a, from the Brundtland Commission of Our Common Future, that a state uh, or define what is sustainable development. No? So this is uh, quite close like a, to the Norwegian attachments and it's like a why we believe on this common agenda and how you can continue supporting in our efforts like to achieve a better sustainable urbanization uh, around the world. Um, from the uh, definition of, of, sustainable, uh, of, of sustainability in general, that is development that, needs, uh, that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations. Uh, this is quite important because like, uh, uh, now we are in the process of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we have to eat the agenda 2030, uh, so like a, to, to achieve like a certain objective. And it's quite important for us because it's like a, for the first time we have an urban goal. 
So, uh, so it's like a certain indicators that are measuring like an advancement of urbanization trends uh, for uh, cities. And more particularly, and related to the event, we have one that is particularly related to uh, SDLE 11.7 that is related to public space. So actually wanted to read it uh, only like a to, to, to have in the, in, the, in the same line, that it says that we need to provide universal access to safe, inclusive, and accessible green and public spaces, particularly for women and children, older persons, and persons with disabilities. So it's quite important on the activities that we are doing now in, in, in this program that we are initiating, it's like a, also like a to support the accessibility that it was mentioned a lot uh, for, uh, in the, during all the presentations of these vulnerable groups of communities on how to improve uh, green and blue networks in our cities. So this initiative, the first initiative that was mentioned at the beginning and the one that is mentioned by uh, Eric uh, many times, is important uh, because we believe that uh, it is bringing like a the perspective like a from uh, urban river regeneration and the importance like a for sustainable development. So I think and we believe like a this is a, a long path. Uh, this is something that we have initiated like a with a serious um, events and the uh, amazing case studies actually uh, from from Kenya, uh, Indonesia, uh, Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, Brazil, and Oslo, our host city, is uh, in amazing of the diversity and the complexity of topics that we can touch base when we are talking about urban rivers. No, like from the question of uh, equity from the questions like a from nature-based solutions, like a from the aspect of economic aspect or the pressure of gentrification. But this also comes together with the, uh, of a knowledge of practice that we wanted to learn from each other because I think like a, a, through the network we can cross fertilize like a, the different knowledge and experiences that you are bringing like a from your own organization. Um, I think like uh, in general, what we wanted to bring is like a uh, to common methodologies, uh, tools and exchange of experience. And actually like uh, this uh, could lead like uh, to a stronger normative and tools like uh, to support uh, other countries that maybe are facing like a different phase of development. But uh, as one of the speaker was saying, like uh, this is a long process, 20, 30 years like uh, for urban river regenerations. So it's like uh, to in, in order like uh, to improve conditions. And some of the projects that was showcased uh, during the presentation are towards like uh, this uh, improvement and this, like uh, they are uh, coming in the in the right path. Uh, from the Global Public Space Program, it's like a, we are supporting a lot of these projects, and you have seen like a, the, the interaction like a, with uh, different of the partners, and actu actually like a, the implementation is coming like a, from the ground. Even like a, one of the tools that was showcased, like a one Minecraft that uses a game for community participation, is not only we are applying in developing context, it's also in Oslo we have a project that they were using the block by block methodology in Minecraft to integrate the ideas of youth on the improvement of public space. Uh, so I will have the opportunity like, to visit this project and actually uh, there will be nice like, to, to see how these tools can, uh, can, can be used also like, to improve like, a, a different uh, contexts. So uh, with that, uh, I wanted to not to, to take very long on this one. So it's like a, only like a, to invite you like a, to, to come join us like a, to support with your expertise. But some of the statistics that were mentioned before, no, like that half of the population are living in cities, and this is true, but it's like a depending of the uh, of the regions of the world, no, Europe is like 80% urbanized, etc. But it's like a, there are some regions that are still in this process. But for us, it's quite important. I think that the, the issue of housing, so it's like a, with the monitoring of slums in the world, we have managed to put in the agenda uh, people living in slum-like condition. And actually, there are good news because like uh, the percentage of people living in slums are reducing. But it's like uh, this awareness of evidence base of like uh, what is happening in the situation of the world is, is quite important. But uh, I wanted to highlight that 75% of people living in cities are living near a river. So actually, this is quite important why we are uh, focusing on this topic because it's like uh, we are 
targeting all these populations that live near the river, that uh, their livelihood is related to a river, that is like the only possibility of housing or land is next to a river. And it's like a, we have seen that there are like a different and diverse entry points uh, on this one. So with that, thanks, thanks a lot. This was uh, part also of a global celebration, the, the World uh, Habitat uh, Day. So it's like a, this is a kind of a global event. Thanks a lot to, to the audience also following online. This is not only here, but also we have actually the majority of people that are uh, joining like a, to this initiative. And thanks a lot again like a, for the organizers. I hope to join us and uh, make efforts like a, to improve sustainability, public spaces, and urban rivers around the world. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Jose, for an excellent summing up. Uh, we certainly look forward to uh, discuss with you whilst you are in uh, Oslo, but also in uh, the coming uh, months, how we could concretize uh, the follow-up of uh, this very, very fruitful uh, event. So, we have now reached the closing of this webinar. And uh, I would just like to mention that this is the second event in the uh, Habitat Norway's uh, Urban October campaign. Uh, this meeting will be uh, followed by uh, discussion meetings in uh, Trondheim, in uh, Stavanger, and uh, there will be a huge university uh, conference in uh, Molde on the, the city for all. The next event in uh, Oslo is on uh, the 27th of October in uh, the Munk uh, Museum uh, on the topic of uh, neighborhoods, uh, public space for everyone. So thank you very much for your uh, patience and to uh, the millions of spectators out there. I would just say uh, thank you uh, very much. We, uh, we hope to uh, see you again. And a special greeting to uh, my friends at the architectural school in Thessalonica. Thank you. Habitat Norway would like to invite everyone, in particular the presenters and uh, the speakers, to join us in a social gathering at the pub, Dr. Jekyll. Please, Mark, it's not Dr. Hyde, but it's Dr. Jekyll. In Klingebergata 4, it's about 500 meters from here. And please follow the beautiful ladies at the back row.